chapter five. Let's have a little fun. Whole chapter on thermochemistry. The first thing we're going to talk about is the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics actually says that energy can't be created or destroyed. We sometimes call it the conservation of energy. Mathematically, though, we write it just like this. And you're like, that means energy can't be created or destroyed. It does. Delta E here stands for the change in internal energy. Change in internal energy. And most commonly in this context, you'll be talking about it in, the, in terms of a gas. So, but we'll just talk about it in terms of any system. So it turns out we'll talk about this equation in the context of def you know, defining the universe as having exactly two things in it, the system and the surroundings. The system is what you're looking at. The surroundings is everything else in the entire universe. So in this case, delta E is that change in internal energy of whatever system you are looking at. Q here is change in heat. So heat can enter the system. And if it enters the system, where must it have come from? The surroundings, or it can leave the system, and if heat leaves the system, where must it have come, or where is it going? To the surroundings. So in this case, if heat enters the system, the system is gaining the heat, that's when Q is positive. But if heat leaves the system and enters the surroundings, so then Q is negative in that case. So it's all relative to the system. If the system is gaining energy, i.e. in this case heat, positive Q. If it's losing energy, negative Q. Cool, W, work, or more properly, the change in work. This is the other way that energy can enter or leave a system. So in this case, you cannot create or destroy energy. It must enter or leave a system in one of a couple of ways. That's why we can call this the first law of thermodynamics in kind of a mathematical expression. So work here. Either the system does work or the surroundings do work. If the system does work, the system is doing work on the surroundings. And if the surroundings do work, the surroundings are doing work on the system. So let's pretend that you guys are the system right now. So let's say that I think there's gold buried beneath this building. And so I give you both a pickaxe. And for the next 12 hours, you're just pickaxing in the floor. You're doing a bunch of work. Are you going to end up with more or less energy in 12 hours? Assuming you find no gold, especially. You're going to end up with less. When the system does work, just like when you do work, it ends up with less energy. So if the system does work on the surroundings, W is negative. The system is losing energy. The converse, though, it turns out if the surroundings do work on the system, that's the other way the system can gain energy, and W would be positive instead. And work is measured in joules. So work is energy, so, and the most common unit for energy is joules. So we can also measure energy in calories, it turns out, as well. But joules is much more common for you guys at this stage of the game. So you've got to know the semantics here, though. If I say that the system loses 10 joules worth of heat. What does that mean Q is? Negative. Negative 10 joules. And the surroundings do 50 joules of work on the system. Positive. Positive 50. And so what would be the change in internal energy? Positive 40. Great. So, but that's the semantics. You got to know based on how I describe the heat being gained or lost by the system and whether the system's doing work or the surroundings doing work on whether these are positive or negative. And based on that, you could then figure out what's the overall change in internal energy. The most common type of work we talk about is what we call PV work. And PV work has not that. Delta V, can't talk and write at the same time. So PV work has the formula negative P times delta V. P here is pressure. Pressure is always positive. There's no such thing as a negative pressure. Goes down to zero, but no lower. So, and then delta V is the change in volume. So let me ask you a question. Are you afraid of the air in this room? Is it pretty scary? Not so much. Would you be afraid that this air would hurt you if you swung an ax through the wall of this room? Like all of a sudden the ax punctures the wall and the air is scary. Now what if I had a can of super highly compressed air and I took an ax and I hit that can? Would you be afraid of that? Maybe. So depending on you know, how it shoots out, it might shove the can up your nose or something like that, you know, things of a sort. But compressed air has more energy than non-compressed air. And so if you go from the air in this room that's non-compressed, if it becomes compressed into a small container here, does it end up with more energy or less energy? It ends up with more. And so in this case, in going from a very large volume to a very small volume, is delta V positive or negative? Uh, positive? Negative. We're getting smaller. So think about your bank account. If you had a billion dollars and then you wasted it all and now you have 33 cents, 
the value of your bank account went down. That's a negative change. So in this case, our volume went from big volume to small volume. That's a negative change. If we have a negative change, factor in that negative sign where it comes out positive. So as it should, because we are giving that gas a bunch of energy by compressing it. One thing to note here, does a gas compress itself? No, who compresses it? I do, you do, somebody does. The surroundings compress the gas. So notice even in the way we talk about it, the surroundings are doing the work. And when the surroundings do the work on the system, the system gains energy and W is positive. So in this case, we're pushing the gas together. We're doing it, the gas won't do it itself. Now, however, if I have this gas that's all compressed, and if somehow I had a magic switch that made the can that it's in disappear, what would that gas do? Just, I flick the switch and the can just vaporizes into thin air. What does that gas do? It expands and it pushes the surroundings back. And so it's doing work on the surroundings. And if the system does work on the surroundings, W is? The system does the work. If you do the work and you're the system, do you have more energy or less energy when you're done? Less. And so when the system does work, W is negative. So when a gas expands, delta V is positive. Delta V is positive, P is always positive, but the negative sign means that work comes out negative. So for an expansion, work is negative. For a compression, work is positive. So what's the symbol for enthalpy? H. And so the change in enthalpy would be called delta H. So and it's the first example of what we call a state function. A state function is something that only depends on the initial and final state of the system. Nothing else matters. The initial state and the final state of the system. I don't care what pathway you take to get there. So if these tables were a little stronger, I might jump up on one. But I'm not gonna test them out. So regardless of whether I just kind of stepped up or whether I jumped up and did a flip and then landed on the table, I took two different pathways, would that change, would my altitude change be different in either case? No, because I start from the same place on the floor, I end up at the same place on the table, doesn't matter how I get there, the altitude change is the same. Altitude change is an example of a state function. We say they're independent of path, so, or that only depends on the initial and final states of the system. Uh, in this case, delta H is your first state function. In fact, we're going to talk about a lot of them, especially next semester. But you should know Q and W, not state functions. Delta E is a state function, but Q and W are not. Notice if I told you that I gained 100 joules of internal energy, could you tell me what Q is? No, because it actually depends on what path you take. If delta E is plus 100, this could be plus 100 and this could be 0. This could be plus 50 and plus 50, plus 75, plus 25, plus 100, zero. You know, there's all sorts of combinations that all depend on the pathway. These are totally pathway dependent. But delta H and delta E, I don't care what pathway you take. It only depends on the initial and final state of the system. The only two examples I will ever talk about that are not state functions, Q and W. Memorize them as such. Know what a state function is? No, Q and W are not state functions. Just about anything else I could ever talk about is. Cool, enthalpy changes. Turns out that enthalpy change is the same thing as Q as long as you're carrying out a reaction at constant pressure. That's what that little subscript P means. So probably a definition worth knowing. This is technically the definition of delta H. It's Q as only if the reaction is carried out at constant pressure. So notice, what's the, what's the approximate pressure in this room? I know we're a little bit above sea level, but not too bad. What's the approximate pressure in this room? One atmosphere. About an atmosphere. A little less because we're a little above sea level, but whatever. If I do a, a reaction on top of the table here, chemical reaction in a couple beakers, maybe acid-base neutralization, what will be the pressure in the room when I'm done? Same. The same. It didn't change. That would be an example of a reaction carried out at constant pressure. And Q and delta H would be the same in that case. So the typical, when you don't, you know, if I don't carry out a reaction just out open to the atmosphere here, but I carry it out in an enclosed vessel, what would happen if inside we started producing gas? What happened to the pressure inside that closed vessel? It would go up. And this would not be true for that reaction anymore. So if you carry out a reaction in an enclosed vessel and it either produces or uses up gas, the pressure will change and this will not be true. But for reaction at constant pressure, delta H and Q are the same thing. Cool. So sometimes we'll call the enthalpy change the heat of the reaction, even though it's just slightly different because it only is truly the heat of the reaction at constant pressure. Two situations, delta H is either negative or delta H is positive. And what do we call the names here for those two situations? If H is more than zero, it's going to be endothermic. Good, delta H is positive or greater than zero, it's endothermic. And delta H is negative, 
exothermic. So notice what this really means. Delta H is negative. It means the system is losing the heat. Heat is being evolved from the system. Where's it going? Into the surroundings. If I had a temperature in the surroundings, what would happen to it? If I had a thermometer in the, if I have a temperature. If I had a thermometer measuring the temperature of the surroundings, what would happen to it? It would go up because it's gaining the heat that the system is giving off. So notice if I did an acid-based neutralization reaction, the molecules inside the water are reacting, but the water would be the surroundings. And if I have a thermometer in the surroundings and I have an acid-based neutralization go reaction going on, the temperature would go up, just like you said earlier, that the beaker would begin to feel warmer as the reaction happened. So that's exothermic. Endothermic, on the other hand, your cold packs, you know those little things, you click them and they get cold, right? So it turns out you mix, it's mixing a certain specific salt and water. It turns out when that specific salt dissolves in water, it absorbs heat. And it starts absorbing heat from the surroundings, making the surroundings feel cold. And if your arm happens to be on there, then your arm is the surroundings and it makes your arm feel cold because it's sucking the heat out of your arm. So that's endothermic. We can also talk about the phase changes in terms of endo and exothermic as well. These are not reactions, but just processes. In this case, these are physical changes, not chemical changes. So turning a solid into a liquid, what do we call that? Good. Fusion or melting. You should know both names. Liquid into a gas. What do we call that? Vaporization. Vaporization. If you were in the kitchen, what would you call it? Um. Call it boiling. boiling. <laughs> Sweet. And then finally, you wouldn't typically do this in the kitchen, but what is turning a solid into a gas? Sublimation. 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 All three of these processes are endothermic. They require heat. So notice if I have a bar of chocolate just sitting on the table, will it melt? Just sitting there. Um, no, yeah. but if I stick it under my armpit, give it a little heat, it will totally melt. So it turns out melting or fusion is an endothermic process. It requires heat. So does water just boil itself? Bottle of water sitting on the table, is it going to boil itself? No, you got to give it a certain amount of heat to make it boil. Same thing with sublimation also requires heat. If you do the exact reverse processes here, gas to liquid, liquid to solid, or gas to solid. First of all, you got to know their names. So gas to liquid, what do we call this? Condensation. Good, condensation. What would you call it if you were in the kitchen? Condensation, I'm just messing with you. So <laughs> liquid to solid. Good, crystallization. But crystallization is kind of a technical term we use for it. And this is one example where more commonly than using the technical term, we'll use the kitchen term and call it freezing. So liquid to solid. But crystallization, also another name. It's on your handout. Gas to solid, though. It's the one we all forget. Deposition. So deposit that in your head. Sometimes called vapor deposition. Same diff. Cool. So notice the two confusing ones that students struggle with deposition and fusion. So avoid the confusion of fusion and deposit deposition in your head. So, because I know that students often struggle with those two, guess which ones I want to ask about on a test. Deposition and fusion, actually. I, I might throw sublimation in there as well. That's a little bit hard. But the easy ones, we don't like asking easy questions because this is chemistry and things are supposed to be hard. And the dumber we make you feel, the smarter we feel. It's fantastic. All right. For all three of these, they're the exact reverse process of the ones we just talked about. And so they all, instead of needing heat, they all give off heat. Their delta H's are negative. They're exothermic. And this seems a little bit funky. So if I do a reaction in a beaker, what would it feel like if I did an exothermic reaction? It would get warm. Freezing is an exothermic process. Does that seem to make sense? No. What is your freezer's job in making ice cubes? What's more specific? If you had to give me a technical term of its job. Well, let's turn liquid to solid. How? It's taken out the heat. So notice your freezer's job is to remove heat. It takes the heat that's inside the freezer and pumps it out. Because you need to lose heat to get from liquid to solid. That's your freezer's job. So it seems backwards, you're like, wait a minute, Chad, you just told me that beakers get hot when an exothermic reaction happens. So what's producing the heat when it, that beaker gets hot, when an exothermic reaction happens, the system or the surroundings? The system. 
What's causing the cold when I freeze some ice cubes? The surroundings, the freezer. It's just sucking the heat out of my system. In both cases, the system's losing heat. So freezing is definitely exothermic. Condensation, also exothermic. It's often better to get a bunch of hot water in your face than to get a bunch of steam in your face. What happens when steam hits a cold window? It fogs up because it's condensing. So, and it releases a bunch of heat onto that window. What happens when a bunch of hot steam hits your cold face? It condenses and releases a boatload of heat right into your face and gives you a really nasty burn. So often a steam burn worse than just a simple hot water burn because of condensation.